We're working out here, yeah. So, you know the uh, similarity between Italians and fighter pilots? Very good. Am I on here? <laughs> yeah, you're on there. That's good. If you tie their hands behind the back, they can't talk. <laughs> fighter pilot, I was there, I had you. So that's why I'm using the cordless mic here. So I uh, just want to point out a little few logistic things. Uh, restrooms here. Uh, I'd like you to all stand up for a moment. And in military precision, just like the uh, Thunderbirds, I'd like you to take and rotate your chairs toward the screen and then spread out a little bit for back. So back and back up a little bit. And if you need to uh, uh, bring the tables apart a little bit, maybe this table looks a little tight. Maybe if you could move it that way. Good. Okay, everybody said, and how about uh, our friend down here? Can you see the screen? All right, good. All right, that's good. You can take a seat. I wanted to feel comfortable. <coughs> um, I'd like to point out a couple of uh, distinguished guests here from us uh, who are not from our church. Uh, my friend, Mr. Bill Doty, served in the Air Force. Thank you for your service, sir. Um, Mr. Peter Wank, uh, did you play jumbos amongst other things? Hello. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I did. Okay, Pan Am pilot, and uh, lots of highly experienced time. You, you could be talk up here talking tonight about your stories. Um, uh, Mr. Dick Langer, uh, just retired, uh, many years uh, Southwest captain, uh, didn't bend any metal, 40 years of flying, praise God. Uh, F-4 pilot, Vietnam. So, uh, my friend Dick Dayton, he's my helper with my plane. Uh, uh, he lives down the end of the street, very active in uh, First Baptist Bellevue with the Young People's Kids Program. What do they call that? The uh, Good News Club. Good News Club. So, yeah. praise God. Um, <clears throat> in fighter pilot world, when you go to train on something, you always talk about the uh, fire hose effect. You know, uh, they don't think things are second nature. It's just that you go to sit in training and it's coming hot and heavy. So that's kind of what I planned for you tonight. It's going to go fast. So uh, we'll have a good time. There's not going to be a test, is there? There's going to be a test. <laughs> <laughs> How's that sound back there? OK? All right. This is really exciting. I, my favorite thing in the world to do is to be in this hangar right here, tinkering my plane. Up until a month ago, my helicopter was right here. It's on the way to a new owner now down in Brazil. So uh, I needed to simplify my life a little bit. I've been wanting to get back into this sort of ministry, so this is kind of my debut to get back into it. So, uh, as time goes by this evening, I want to share a few things of my flying experience. I know our, our highly experienced pilots could really tell stories like this. I've chosen a couple of select ones, hopefully be helpful to show some parallels about eternal realities. So, uh, like we've been talking about, this is our church. It's the closest church to Leeward Air Ranch. By the crow, as crow flies a mile and a half away or so, I, I was really blessed and excited when I discovered this place even existed a few years ago. Uh, I'm going to talk tonight about the two realms, uh, flying high in airplanes and flying high with the Almighty. Um, just jumping for, ahead a minute in my story, I'm a, uh, you might say, a glorified uh, bus driver. <laughs> flying planes around when all the rest of you were sound asleep Tuesday morning. I was uh, ferrying a plane, that means flying empty, from Indiana in the middle of the night at the Mountain Home Air Force Base in Idaho. Um, another crew filled it up with soldiers, airmen, and uh, they went and flew over to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and the new crew Soldiers stayed on board, went over to Germany, which coincidentally, the base they stopped at is a civilian airport. But that's where I used to fly the F-4 back in the Cold War days. It's now a civilian airport, kind of a small world. Changed the crew again, and they flew right down through Turkey and Saudi Arabia into Amman al Dafra, where this, our American troops are doing some training down there. So, uh, <coughs> in, the air, in the airlines, we, we talked about deadhead. Anybody heard that term before? Um, if the airline needs to move you from point A to point B, they buy you a ticket, you sit in the back. 
That's deadheading, also maybe known as dozing for dollars. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's interesting, uh, this past six months or ten months or so, I've been doing a lot of deadheading. This is just the last six months. I mean, I'm always flying around as a passenger. It's interesting when you go to check in at the gate to get your boarding pass. What's the good lady said? What's your final destination? Heaven, what's yours? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you, but I used to be kind of bored about the idea of heaven. I said, what are you going to be doing? Floating around in the clouds and not, not knowing, boring up there. Well, as time went by, I read, went to read a little bit more about heaven. I mean, this is a nice place. We talk about Leeward Air Ranch being a little paradise, a little heaven on earth. But well, we ain't seen nothing yet. You look at the scriptures and it talks about God is going to create a new heavens. And new earth, the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. We're talking about eternity and glory. The scriptures say, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has even entered into our imagination what God has prepared. So I often think about that when somebody says, what's your final destination? Heaven. Amen? Amen. <laughs> this book just blew me away. Anybody familiar with Johnny Erickson Tata? 16-year-old mm -hmm. girl years ago, very active, horse, horse girl, had a diving accident paralyzed from the waist down. She's had a 50-year ministry worldwide, touched thousands and thousands of lives. Her books are so powerful. This book is so powerful. I could only read one chapter a week. I just, it was all I could take. It just blew me away. If you're ever interested in the subject of heaven, read Johnny. It's a girl. Her father wanted a guy. And, and, okay. <laughs> Every pilot here in our community uh, has their story, how they started out from flying. I'm going to give you my short version of it. I grew up as a kid on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. My dad was a former Marine Corps sergeant, big strong guy. His cousin flew <coughs> into the Cape Cod airport one day. And I'll never forget one of my very first memories in life. My dad picked me up, five-year-old kid, and set me in that pilot seat. I'm like this. I was hooked forever. I was hooked on flying from that moment on. Um, <clears throat> you can see that was the start of my joy and pursuit of aviation. Not many years later, we moved as a family from Cape Cod to Tripoli, Libya. Anybody heard of Tripoli, Libya? <laughs> you probably flew in there, didn't you? Okay. Um, the American Air Force had a big bombing range there. Uh, and our fighter crews from Europe back in the 50s and 60s would go to Libya uh, to do their bombing training. My father was an electrical engineer. Right across the street from where we lived was a big Arab mosque each morning, uh, five times a day actually. Allah, 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 Muhammad Rasulullah. You know, you can hear all the, I can still recite some of the Arabic uh, prayers. Uh, so, I'm a little kid, 12 years old, walking along the shores of the Mediterranean Ocean. Right next to me is this runway. Fighter operations are going on. Big, shiny F-100 Super Saber airplane taxis out onto the runway. I'm watching the flight lane give the signal, run up the engines. Release, hit the burner. Like this. <laughs> And I'm thinking, what is my destiny? What am I going to become in life? Right at that moment, I said, that's it. That's my destiny. It's a great thing as a young person if you can see something to pursue, a goal to pursue. I was very fortunate. I had this passion early on. Well, you've got to really excel through life to get to that point. Uh, a lot of people, you know, we talk in the fighter pilot world, all mock and no vector. You heard that expression before? Mm -hmm. You go on a thousand miles an hour, but where are you going? You got no vector. And a lot of us in life, sometimes we get that moment. We're busy with activity, but we never slow down to say, what is this all about? What am I living for? What's my destiny? You know, if you think about what's your destiny, you're an eternal being. 
you're here for a measly little 80 years, but your life and your new resurrection body is going to go on forever. Uh, so <clears throat> when I ask about what's your destiny, think not only next 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years, what is going to be happening? What we do in this middle, little, little 80 year life has eternal consequences. Um, every fighter mission I ever went on, we brief forever, right? Dick, uh, and they always talk about what's your targets and what's your tactics. What are you all about? What are you trying to do? And how are you going to do it? So that's kind of a parallel we can take into life, is to see what is our target in life. So time goes by. I'm a college student. I go through the screening program, flying Cessnas, the Air Force paid for it. Thank you, by the way, taxpayers paying for my college training. <laughs> well, well spent. I head off to Columbus, Mississippi to start 52 weeks of intense Air Force pilot training. Six months you fly in the Tweety Bird here, a little 6,000 pound dog whistle, dog whistle made by Cessna. And then you go to fly the White Rocket. Um, supersonic <clears throat> trainer. Your job as a student to go out and make mistakes and come back the next day and do it again. And then you still got a paycheck, you know. Uh, love flying it. But my whole time in pilot training, I'm focused on assignment night. Where am I going to spend my career in the Air Force? Because every flight you go on, you're being evaluated by your friendly instructor. <laughs> He's got a 30-point uh, evaluation. How was your takeoff, your landing, your radio calls, your loop? All this sort of stuff. Unsatisfactory, fair, good, excellent. And all that's going into the computer. There's only a handful of fighters that are going to come down. When assignment times comes, uh, you say, what am I going to do? Where am I going to be serving in the Air Force? So kind of related to that, here's a question for you. Why do the right thing when no one else is watching? Of course, the shorter answer is someone is watching. One example. Um, some years ago, I'm flying a 747 into Amsterdam in the Netherlands. We go to the hotel. I get my key to my room, make a beeline to my room, put down my bag, go to the bathroom, get a big towel, cover up the television and unplug it. You know why? There's pornographic channels on the TV and I don't even want to go there. I want to please the Lord in everything I do. Why do the right thing when no one else is watching? Because assignment night is coming. Um, in assignment night, you're going to get either transports, you're going to get tankers, one or the other. What's your assignment going to be? Or B-52s or fighters. Now, no offense meant to heavy drivers. I've been one myself now 15 years or so. But I had to get a fight. You know, I would have died from <laughs> embarrassment and disappointment if I didn't get a fighter assignment. So you can imagine two weeks before graduation, we're all at the officers' club. The colonel's got the secret list, and the tension is just off the charts. You know. So we're all sitting there, what are we going to do? Where are we going to serve in the Kingdom of the Air Force? So he starts reading it out. Lieutenant Steve Hager, C-141, Norton Air Force Base, California. Yes, that's what he wanted, going to the airlines. Lieutenant Neil Berg, I'll never forget, it was like yesterday. B-52, Minot, North Dakota. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Charles Magnuson, F4E, Phantom, Hot Air Booster, yes! <laughs> my destiny. I don't know about you, but my passion has become to live for the day that I'm face to face with the King of the Universe. My passion has become to live for the day 
It's the question for you, living for today or for the day when you're going to see the king. Um, this is my passion. I want to hear these words from the Lord when I see him. I'm talking about the eternal creator of the universe. Come on in. Hello. Hey. Come on in. Find a seat. What's my passion to hear these words? He says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. You catch that? That's a sign of night right there. Eternal rewards is not about getting things for yourself. It's about better positioning yourself to serve the king in all eternity. You want him to look good. That's what eternal words are about. That's my passion for living. Someday, like I said, we're all going to be held account for what we've been doing with what God has given us. There is an eternal kingdom coming. This is just passing. What we do here is incredibly important. How you love your wife, how you serve your employer, on and on and on, has internal consequences because assignment night is coming. So, let's move on with my story. Uh, with my F4 Phantom assignment, I went on to what's called fighter lead-in. Uh, you fly the T-38 in a more of a tactics type role. And then I went on to uh, California and got fully checked out in the F-4 Phantom. Showed up over in Germany, back in the Cold War days. Um, fully qual qualified in the F-4, combat rate. Here's your Gatling gun. Anybody know what the, the uh, rounds rate? 6,000. 6,000 rounds per minute, exactly. 100 rounds a second. Nice little weapon. Yeah. Firepower of this thing, uh, one F4 can outdo a B-17 from World War II as far as the bombs on target. So, <clears throat> just one little story here. As a fighter pilot, I always wanted to find an opportunity to better my skills as a fighter pilot. So give me, give me the best to go up and fight. So I'm a young lieutenant one day in Germany, and this one major, they called him Raja. Everybody had his tactical call sign. Uh, you know what mine was? Magnum. Magnum, right? And then, of course, this TV show came out in the early 80s, uh, Magnum PI. So what did they start calling me? Magnum IP, <laughs> you know, <laughs> constructor pilot. Anyways, um, this major, he flew like 50 air-to-air -air sorties a month because he was an instructor. And we lowly lieutenants maybe got two air-to-air -air flights a month. So uh, there was a captain more experienced than me that went up and fought against, uh, you know, head-to-head -head fight, fights on. And given the better skill of the major, they had about two turns. And then here's the major right at the six of the captain blowing his brains out with the gun. So my day is coming up the next day. A little lowly lieutenant here is going to fight the major. And I said, I want to at least, captain got two turns before he was being shot down. I said, I want to get three turns. <laughs> I knew the inevitable. He was going to be back there at my six, shoot me down. But anyways, uh, this reminds me. When hard times come in your life, what does God's word say? Count it all joy. When you go up to fight against the major, when you go to fight up whatever's bothering you, count it all joy. Why is that? Because the trials of various kinds, uh, the testing of faith produces steadfastness, a steadfastness let it have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So something to think about when you're facing difficult times, or whatever it is, scriptures say, count it all joy. By the way, these uh, F-4s we flew were in storage for over 30 years now. And if any of you go to Oshkosh, the big fly flying up there in Wisconsin, 10,000 airplanes on the ground at one time, something like that. I was walking around a couple years ago, and I said, boy, I recognize that plane. That's so familiar. And I looked at it over, and looked at the tail number. These planes were in storage for over 30 years in the boneyard in uh, Davis Mountain in Arizona. 
they're back in the air again as in the drone program. Hmm. And some of them, they just fly around to chase the drones. And this plane, I hadn't seen in over 30 years. I had flown it 12 times in Germany. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Anyways, so I finished my first fighter tour in Germany. Why don't we uh, bring this down here? The wind's kind of picked up. And I got a good deal of assignment in a sense of, uh, <coughs> I went to be an instructor in Texas in what they call NJET, Euro-NATO Joint Jet Pilot Training. At the time, there were like 12 nations under one roof. Can you imagine the Greeks and the Turks and the Italians and the Brits and the Dutch and everybody all on one roof doing pilot training all together? I don't know now, there's probably 20 nations there at Shepard Air Force Base in Texas. And I was instructor in a T-37. Um, it's pretty rewarding, actually, as an instructor, because when you first start with your student, he's brand new. He barely knows how to put on the flight suit. And six months later, he's pretty proficient. He can probably uh, transition into almost anything in the sky. So it's pretty rewarding from that point of view. So that was also the time I built my little airplane. Uh, Tuesday this week is the 29th anniversary of the test flight of that plane that's parked out in front of the hangar. And by the way, who's our six brave souls that went up today? You all did well. Good on you. Uh, I keep names. I'm at, uh, what did I say, 482 different people I've had up so far. Getting close to 500. Um, there it is down in Lakeland. Now, you pilot types might be curious. Some of the other, uh, just a little technical detail here. 1,500 pounds, gross weight. And um, F-16, 42,000. The new 747s that uh, de uh, my company, Atlas Air, is flying now, close to a million pounds takeoff weight. Hmm. And you say, well, what's the fuel consumption? Round numbers, my little long easy, seven gallons per hour. Cruise, F-16, 1,000. 747, 3,000 gallons per hour. Now, we pilots usually don't think in these terms, but I can cruise in the easy 185 miles an hour, no speed limits up there, 25 miles a gallon. Now, how about the 747 cruising along 400 people, 600 mile an hour? It gets about 50 miles per gallon per person. Per person. Yeah, pretty good. <laughs> I actually had my plane in Spain for a year and flew it seven times to... Switzerland and back through the Alps. I don't know if you saw my flight simulator over here. This is actually uh, flying over in uh, Switzerland. And I flew my plane, this was before I put the Thunderbird pink scheme on, up to England. And this was the picture actually I flew from Spain up to England. And uh, somewhere along the line, anybody know that mountain? Matterhorn. Matterhorn, over 14,000 feet. I put a Swiss guy in the back seat. This little plane sitting right out here. And we circled the peak at 14,000 feet. There were climbers up there. How are you doing? You know, <laughs> climb up the side of the mountain. <laughs> we were circling the top. So that, that plane has just been very exciting. I, I pity people that go through life and they never do any creative works. They're just uh, watching other people do things. If you've ever gone through the blood, sweat, and tears of rebuilding a plane or making a plane or building something that didn't exist before, it's an enormously satisfying thing. You know, scriptures say we're, we're made in the image and likeness of God. Well, one of his big characteristics is, guess what? He's the creator. So I encourage you, to, you know, if you don't find something creative to do, uh, you're missing something out. Try it. Uh, you know, I've flown my plane, as uh, you have, to little airports all over the world. One of the questions I often get is, did you build it? You know, after two years of intense, literal blood, sweat, and tears, I said, no, 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 I, did, I didn't build it. It evolved out of an explosion in a fiberglass earthport factory. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of my uh, joys of flying over the years is I meet people all over the world. Um, and I try to engage in conversation if they're interested in eternal matters, spiritual things, and so forth. And I've had many, many discussions on the subject of origins. You know, where did we come from? What are we doing here? What's the future hold? Uh, creation, evolution, and so forth. 
I realized just recently that I've been kind of going about it the wrong way. The evidence is really overwhelming, if everybody, anybody ever wants to see it, that God exists. But it's like, how come a thief can't find a policeman? He doesn't want to find a policeman. You know? um, the scriptures in Romans chapter, chapter 1 clearly say, I never saw this so clearly before, that everybody knows, everybody knows God exists. But the scriptures say some choose to deny it because of unrighteousness. little short story there. Um, Flying into Frankfurt years ago, 747, one of the pilots I was flying with, married guy, children back in the States, I wanted to see if he had any interest in talking spiritual things. It's like, flip the switch, he's red in the face, angry and everything, and oh, you know, there's no God. Uh, man, religion's all man-made, it's all a bunch of bunk. I said, okay, okay. So we landed in Frankfurt. A few minutes later, we're in the uh, limo going to the hotel, he picks up his cell phone, dials a number, starts speaking in German. He doesn't realize I speak fluent German. <laughs> Who is he talking with? His German girlfriend. Very convenient that there's no God in your thinking if you're doing things you know are not right. So that I've come to realize these discussions about creation and evolution for a lot of people really has nothing to do with science, but it's everything to do with sovereignty and sin. People's religion of choice is really atheism because they don't want there to be a God. Because there is a creator God, then he's the boss. And I don't like that. I want to be my boss. So I think my new approach is if someone said, prove to me God exists, where is the evidence? I'm not even going to go there. I say, you know God exists just like I do. The difference Amen. is I've chosen to trust and obey him and you have yeah. Until you humble your attitude, anything I say, you just don't want to hear. There is a place for believers to build our faith stronger for what you call apologetics or evidences. Very strong. I could talk about that for the next month of Sundays. Uh, the, the, the evidence is just overwhelming. You think about the human eye. You think about anything, living thing. is so complex. So Romans 8, as we're saying, the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness, men who by or because of their unrighteousness suppress the truth. They know what truth is, but they don't want to accept it. What can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. God's invisible attributes, His eternal power, divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made you know, you have two cameras here in your eyes. You know how many, uh, the estimate points of light are being processed by these two cameras? Your eyeballs, you wake up in the morning, there's the world. 137 million points of information. And what's the brain got to do? Those images are not exactly the same. It's got to instantly transport all that information into one image to give your brain so you can see what's out there. And you think, whoa, wait a minute, this is no creator, this is all happenstance, it's just a big happy accident? I said, no way. No, there's an infinite creator that designed the eye. Okay, moving right along. <laughs> I finished my tour in Texas, T-37 instructor pilot, and finished the long easy. That's where I test flew it, built it out there. I was under enormous time pressure. I worked 23 days straight. 30 days of leave, and then I, I did the 40-hour test period in seven days. <laughs> Got it signed off in Texas, and uh, I flew it to uh, Vandenberg, Tampa, down here, to start F-16 training. I found a, a friendly sergeant that drove my car from Texas. I was under enormous time pressure. But anyways, we got my F-16 assignment. Now, this is kind of fun here. Let's see if we can get it to work. To, earlier today there was a uh, earlier today there was F uh, P51 came down the runway 400 miles an hour or whatever it was going it was pretty impressive let's see this here
get your heart bumping. <laughs> I couldn't believe they paid us a paycheck to fly these. <laughs> so here I am, a young pup. Back before, I used to light my hair on fire and go or terrorize the world. Uh, flying F-16s. When you go through training, uh, it's interesting, in the F-4 switches and combat stuff, it's just a nightmare of switches all over the place. Well, they modernized all that. Now you have what they call playing the piccolo. So your hands on the stick, your hands on the throttle. And everything you need to do for all the weapons, the guns, the bombs, and everything is all right, right up here. This is the radar control. Uh, the tilt switch is there, everything. So that's your throttle. That's where you go burn. And this is the stick. There you drop your bombs down and uh, shoot the gun and blah, blah, blah. So uh, pretty cool. This always reminded me of uh, King David, king of the Israeli army. The scriptures say, David writes, Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. Uh, I'm going to sit down one day with King David in glory and discuss uh, battle tactics and so on. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Buttons and slings. Yes. <laughs> so um, I could talk all day long about fighter stories, but just one. You, you, for those of you who haven't done it before, you ask, what, what, what is it like to uh, go into Mortal Kombat? There's a G suit, best pants. You plug it into the jet, and uh, high pressure air comes in from the jet whenever you go into the G's. I think when I flew with some of you today, you could feel a little G's, but somebody said, Ooh, I'm feeling that. <laughs> you know? Um, but what is it like to go into Mortal Kombat under 9 Gs? And there's some parallels here between this and the Christian life. Sometimes the Lord calls us to go way out of our comfort zone, maybe into 9 G environment. And the question is, in that environment, are you going to thrive or just survive? So what is it like to go 9 Gs? Just to keep the math simple, let's say you weigh about 200 pounds. And full afterburner, you're in a dogfight, life or death. It's maximum concentration. Think about a 400-pound sumo wrestler, okay? Think about four 400-pound sumo wrestlers that instantly pounce on you, flatten you into the floor like a pancake, and stay there. That's what it feels like to have 9Gs. That's 1,800 pounds on your body. And you still got to fight and think and talk on the radio and, and fight this war at 9 Gs. It's pretty incredible. Again, back to what James writes here. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Don't run away from those trials. Say, Lord, you promised me everything I need to do whatever you're calling me to do. Bring it on. One of my favorite examples from Jesus, if you think about it, he's um, about to go to the cross. All the sin of all mankind is going to be laid on him. For the first time in all of his relationship with the Father is going to be separated. And what does he say? Just before he goes to the cross, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? Get me out of here? I don't like this? No, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. That's something that's really helped me over time. When you, really some bad situation is coming, Lord, get me out of here. No, in that time, how you relate to it, what's coming down on you, you can bring incredible glory to the Father. And how are you treating other people? And how you're really expressing your confidence and trust in the Lord in the bad hour. I really, really love the example of the Lord. He said, what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour? Get me out of here? No, but for this purpose, I have come to this hour, this bad hour. Father, glorify your name. In the bad situation. It's something I've been really thinking about and applying and been very helpful. Okay, here's a question for you. Does the Bible record factual history? Are there really real people in real places? Or is it just all made up? This is an example for you from uh, the book of Acts. 
You know, the Apostle Paul that wrote most of the New Testament comes from what town? Tarsus. Tarsus. Okay, he wrote most of the New Testament. What does it say? Paul departed to Tarsus to seek Saul, who was Paul. And he found him, brought him to Antioch. And the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. So here's our question. Are these real people in real places? So I sat alert, nuclear alert, in Turkey on several occasions. This is one of the nuclear weapons we use. We call it the Dr. Pepper bomb. It had a little dial of yield, how much devastation you want to make, that happened to correspond to the three numbers on the Dr. Pepper bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, I've told this story to some of you before, but we were just hanging around the squadron, and um, maintenance had taken these weapons off these two planes that had been alert for two, two months. You don't move with a nuclear weapon on board unless you're going to start World War III. So they took the weapons off, but the planes needed to be flown because they hadn't flown for two months. So maintenance calls up the squadron, hey, we need to buy this, go fly these planes. So the PA announcement, hey, we need to buy this. I run down to the front desk, I'll go, I'll go. So I've briefed up with this other pilot, and off we go. So this is our map here. This is the fighter base here, Angelic Air Base, down in southeast Turkey. And guess what's right there? Tarsus. And I guess what's right here? Antioch. <laughs> so we rooted around, uh, boys when we were boys, playing around the valleys for a while. We went by uh, Konya Range, which you can read about in the New Testament, that's Iconium, one of the names of the cities. And we got tired of that. And I told, called the other pilot up on the radio and said, hey, why don't we go up along the Syrian border? Here's Syria right here. Up and down the Syrian border and do what we call troll, troll for some raw hits. You remember doing that? <laughs> There's Soviet-built radar over here in Syria, and we wanted to see if we could get them to trigger some of our warnings. So, like I say, boys and my boys, we went up to 51,000 feet, Mach 1.3, just up and down the Syrian border here. And uh, you can just start to see the curvature of the Earth. You can just start to see the beginning of the blue-black outer space. It's pretty amazing. Anybody been up that high before? Mm -hmm. It's getting up there. <laughs> so, well, we're kind of blowing some gas out, and it's time to go back home. I looked down at my altimeter. It said 51,000 feet. I looked at my TACAN, which measures how much distance you have back to the field, 51 nautical miles. So this crazy idea comes in my mind. If the F-16, if you lose the engine, a general ballpark figure is one to one. So I called up the uh, other pilot and says, how'd you like to do a space shuttle arrival? He says, good idea. <laughs> We're at 51,000 feet, right around here somewhere. Idle power, simulating we lost our engine, glided to touchdown. It was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my years uh, as fighter pilot were coming to an end. Um, here you can see a tail number. This is one of the last planes I flew. <clears throat> and I hang up my G-suit and uh, went off to Pan Am. Peter flew many years Pan Am. Um, so I uh, ended up being a pilot there. I actually hired as a pilot. Uh, when they interview you back in those days, can this guy be a captain with our airline someday? Yeah, we think so. Well, welcome to our company. Here's your seniority number. That means you go to the bottom of the pile. So even though I was hired as a pilot, he flies a flight engineer, which is fine. I had a job. So uh, I don't have a picture of me, but I did have a white hat. Remember <laughs> <laughs> Pan Am back there? You're the one of the few ones that had uh, white hats. In my worldwide travels, like I say, I enjoyed having discussions with people. Um, people really need to make up their own minds. You can't force them, but we're called to give a testimony, to get people to think, to think, see things in a different light. So one of the questions often asked is, what must I do to be saved? Uh, I'm a sinner. We're talking about an infant holy God. I've offended him. That's bad news. So you go to all a different world religions, and there's really, and it comes down to the bottom line question, there's only two possibilities. 
I said this just recently at church, to go to a religious conference and a huge hall, everybody's got their own booth, and they're presenting their religion. And you go up to every single booth and say, excuse me, I got a question for you. I'm a sinner. I've offended a holy God. I have a huge problem. I need a savior. What are they all going to say? Well, I'm sorry. We've got imams. We've got gurus. We've got uh, rabbis. We've got prophets. We don't have a savior. The only faith in the entire planet that has a Savior is the Christian faith. We have a Savior. Only two possibilities when you stand before a holy God someday and He says, why should I let you into my heaven? What most people are going to say, well, here's my resume. I was a good guy. I did all this good stuff. The other answer is, says, I'm a sinner. I have a big problem. This is my Savior. I'm trusting in Him. Those are really the only two possibilities. The Bible talks about those as either works or grace. And you can't mix the two together. It's either one or the other. It's either human achievement, which you do <coughs> for God, or divine accomplishment, what He's done for you. The moment you uh, come to salvation is when you stop trusting what you can do for God and you start trusting what He did for you. So, when I became a believer's young person, old-fashioned tent crusade on Cape Cod, I didn't know much. But I did know this. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. So here's the question for you. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? Okay. Pan Am. Uh, one of my regular routes was from Kennedy Airport to Barbados down there in the Atlantic Ocean. So one day, um, as a flight engineer on that A300, I didn't really have much to do. It was an automatic <laughs> panel. I did walk around the plane. I often stood the jetway as passengers are coming on board. 254 passengers, and a lot of them pretty anxious. One day, Hurricane Hugo is in our path. Anybody remember Hurricane Hugo? 200 mile an hour sustained winds. Needless to say, we took a pretty wide berth around Hurricane Hugo. A lot of nervous passengers coming on that plane. So here's your question. As they come on down the jetway, and enter the door of the plane, do they take a left turn and come up to the cockpit and say, uh, excuse me, I'm going to be flying this plane today. The captain turns around, yeah, yeah, and, and who are you? And do you know how to fly these planes? No, but I'm going to be flying this plane. Uh, I can do it. Or, as they come down that jetway, do they take a right turn, find their assigned seat, and in that act, put their confidence, their faith, their trust in the pilot and the plane to safely get them through the dark and stormy night to their destination. For me, that's a beautiful picture of what it means to believe. I did a study one time in the New Testament. There's 120 passages that ask, uh, are talking to this question, what must I do to be saved? And there's a little Greek word, pistuo, says believe. Trust in, rely on, depend on, put your confidence in. Like a broken record over and over again. It's like God's pretty clear on this. He's calling us to trust Him. That's what salvation is about. It's not about working. We just want to look at just one of these. Here's Romans 5. What does this say? To the one who does not work, but trust alone in Him who justified. Now, who is God justifying? The ungodly. You see that? The only person going to heaven is the ungodly. The one who says, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. His faith is credited as righteousness. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? You're resting. And what He's done for you, you're not working. Uh, a different question is sanctification. That's assignment night is coming. The only way anybody's going to get to heaven is because of what Jesus did for us. But God's going to reward our faithfulness in this life with eternal rewards. 
but it's not because we worked our way into heaven. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, I saw a boat down in Miami some years ago that had this uh, as the um, back of the transom. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the what? The gift of God, not of works, that anyone can boast. Example of that, Billy Gates comes up to you, multi-billionaire, and says, George, I like you. I'm going to give you a $30 million mansion in the Keys. And I think you need a jet and a helicopter to get there. Right? Need a boat, too. And a boat. <laughs> it's a gift. You reach in your pocket. But well, here's five bucks. What did you just do? You just offended the giver, and it's no longer a gift. Eternal life is a gift. Trust in your captain in the airplane to safely get you through the dark and stormy night. The scriptures talk about Jesus as the captain of our salvation. Mm. <clears throat> well, I uh, got a higher calling. When people see my uniform, they see the senior pilot wings and the cross, and they say, what are you? <laughs> um, but I got a higher calling. I had been kind of floundering around trying to share, share my faith. And I, I really wanted to go to seminaries. I went to Dallas for four years. Dallas Theological Seminary. Um, and tremendous program. Four years. I tell you, my first six months there, my knee time, my prayer time went like this. Lord, help me. I was in my late 30s when I went off to study at a master's level. Tremendous school. So I, I finished there. I was thinking I would jump right back into... Uh, I would jump right into some sort of full-time ministry. As is often the case, God has different plans that, for us than we think what we should be doing. So I went up, ended up going back into flying. There's a lot of lost pilots in the sky, believe me, spiritually lost. So that's kind of been my mission field, so to speak. And I started out back in flying with this little uh, Cessna 402 flying between 10-minute flights from Hyannis to Nantucket <laughs> back and forth. If you ever seen the sitcom Wings on television, that's the real world company that it's based on. And, and I, I shouldn't say this, but a lot of workers are just as dysfunctional <laughs> as some of the people on that sitcom. But uh, here I am, one pilot, nine passengers. That was uh, that. So somewhere along the line, someone said the Air, Air Force Air National Guard is looking for chaplains. So after 12 years out of uniform, I ended up joining the Air Guard as a chaplain and served 12 years part-time as reserves. Uh, you can see this little poster I have on the right. It shows, I was saying, served both roles here. First as an active duty uh, fighter pilot and then as a chaplain here. He's, uh, you can see he's praying for the warrior before he goes off to war. Uh, a lot of interesting people I met along the way. Uh, just one short story. I know Jim likes this story. <laughs> um, I come from New England, and you know the accents up there, the Yankee accents. Well, I worked with this fellow, Father Bob Marciano from R Rhode Island. Delightful fellow. Um, he actually became the chief of uh, chaplains for the National Guard for a while. And he gave this talk to a bunch of chaplains one day, and uh, afterwards someone came up to him. Father Bob, Father Bob, I don't understand. You're always talking about the National God, the National God. I thought that was against the law. It's the <laughs> National <laughs> Guard. <laughs> um, as, as some of you know, I uh, finished my career in the military on a high, high note. I volunteered to go in 2009 for four months to Kyrgyzstan and serve as the senior chaplain there as a reservist and I worked with this active duty Catholic priest. We had two Melissa's support. Uh, tremendous ministry. I mean, uh, when people are getting close to harm's way, they're a lot more attuned to uh, spiritual realities. Tremendous ministry there. That base uh, has two big missions. Um, one is there's a thousand transients a day going in and out of Afghanistan, soldiers. And the other mission is to feed the fight. And all the tanker support to bring the gas to the tankers for the fighters up over Afghanistan. So I did that. I came back in 2009 and uh, retired from uh, service. Now, Atlas Air has been my employer for uh, 
13 years now from 2000. Anybody know what this is? It's a little, uh, I tell people I drive an 18 wheeler. <laughs> Same as 18 wheels. <laughs> this is a 747 freighter. Uh, it's been the biggest plane in the sky until the A380 Airbus came out. This will gross out close to a million pounds. The Airbus is 1.2 million. But I still think this is much more beautiful lines than the Airbus. Uh, some of you pilots are very familiar with this, but uh, this is a simulator. Incredibly realistic. You can go in there and you can sweat, real sweat. Um, <laughs> it's uh, on hydraulic stilts, so you get full motion. If you reject a takeoff and your max braking inside, you're feeling, boy, we are decelerating. Well, they just tilt the body down of a sim like this, you're hanging on the straps. In the same way, if you accelerate, you, you, you feel like you're going like this. Um, very realistic. I took these pictures with a smartphone out the computer-generated window. So you come in and park your plane, and there's a little man there with his <laughs> arms waving at you. And okay, you're there. As soon as you set the parking brake, the crew van shows up to take you to the hotel. <laughs> Pretty amazing. So that's been my uh, life here the last uh, uh, 13 years or so. A 747. Lots of interesting places I've been to. Uh, one of my regular routes was from Europe through Turkey down to Dubai and the Emirates. Anybody know what that is? No, no, no. Japan? Mount Ararat. Oh, one of the most common places. Some believe that maybe uh, that was Ark was up there. Okay. 14,000 foot mountain. So, hmm. anyways, I told this story the other day for those who weren't here to hear it. Um, this is the new Hong Kong airport. And um, as you know, the Chinese took a couple mountains, uh, dumped them into the sea, <laughs> and made this airport here. So when I was a new guy, it was 747 Atlas Air. I landed the plane here, went and parked. Uh, when I was still in the cockpit, still in the seat, uh, our local representative, a Chinese man, comes into the cockpit. He looks at me, I'm a new guy, and he says, Welcome to Hong Kong. I see you, new guy. My name, uh, low fat, but you call me 2%. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Low Fat, very respected fellow, but uh, he insisted everybody call him 2%. <laughs> Flying the 747 freighters, uh, a lot of interesting cargo. No, normally it's just uh, happy boxes, but uh, occasionally we carry animals. I took uh, 700 pigs one time from uh, Oslo, Norway to Stewart, New York, and here we're taking 200 cows, big cows, from uh, New Zealand up to China. Uh, you can see the schnout. Uh, they get a little restless, even though it's a jumbo, you can feel them kicking on the side of their containers. I also flew the uh, Dreamlifter. Anybody know what this does? This is a highly modified 747 freighter with triple the volume capacity inside. And it's only got one mission, and that is to take all the parts of the Dreamliner from the six factories to uh, Everett, Washington for assembly. Hmm. You can see the whole tail swings away, hmm. and they put the whole body of this huge wide body plane inside of your plane, uh, or the wings. So that's been some interesting flying. Yeah, it's a big plane. <laughs> It is huge. Um, Atlas Air also does some uh, unique kind of passenger flying. This is uh, moving uh, oil men from Houston nonstop 14 hours to the uh, southwest part of Africa. Uh, I did some of this flying before I left the 747 moving uh, soldiers. Um, now finally, uh, in, in airlines everything is seniority. If you were a senior uh, airline captain at one uh, company and they go out of business and you go to another company, they say, well, you start at the bottom of the list. So, but I was uh, 12 years and I still couldn't hold seniority at the left seat of the 747. Well, Atlas Air now got these little light twins and I was able to throw my hat in the ring to fly the 767. So it's still a big wide body plane, but as you can count, it only got two engines instead of four. Same engines, basically, as the 747. There's two of them. So we're dual qualified to either fly these freighters uh, domestically or passenger planes, 250 pass passenger planes, uh, mostly moving soldiers or charters for other airlines. 
So I just want to talk briefly about when you go to a, from a four engine plane to two engine plane, it's a totally different set of regulations. If you want to fly across the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the four engine, just power up and you're on your way. Two engine, you've got to go through all these hoops, maintenance, weather, everything, and you've got to check all this stuff because you only got two engines. So there's a whole different set of regulations called ETOPS, Extended Operations. Now, I think I mentioned this before, but uh, what's another way of saying what that means? Engines turn or passengers swim. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when you go through pilot training, uh, as you know, people, uh, one of the big evaluation points in the simulator, you go down every six months in our company for training, and they throw constant emergencies at you for four hours in this box, and uh, it's pretty intense, but the big evaluation thing is what they call the B1 cut. Anytime you're rolling down the runway fully loaded, getting ready to take off, there's a decision speed. If you lose an engine before that, you're going to stand on the binders and stop and hopefully get a stop before you run out of runway. If you're above that speed, then you go. You go with the engine that you got. So that's what this is talking about here. This is this V1 right here. Um, anyways, it's a critical thing. If you imagine you're on a 747 with four engines, and which ones they always going to fail on you? Worst case, it's the outboards, exactly, because that's going to give you the most yaw, and you've got to come in the rudder or you're going to be in the weeds uh, and international headlines. <laughs> By the way, the first time I flew a 747, um, I had never seen an Atlas airplane before. I, I flew it, uh, the instructor uh, flew it from Chicago to San Francisco, demonstrating it, and now it's my turn, the first time ever fly the 747, a short leg from San Francisco to Los Angeles. And uh, it was really busy in a jumbo on a short flight like that, just an hour long. So I never forget, about 11 in the evening, I'm lined up on runway 25 right. You know, first time ever I'm going to land a 747, and this thought crosses through my mind, Peter, if you goober this landing, you're going to be international headlines. <laughs> so it's an interesting job, to say the least. You want to try to... Uh, uh, do your job right each time. Uh, so here I am now in the left seat, uh, 767. Here's some of the soldiers that we move around and uh, a lot of the flights, <laughs> contrary to <laughs> flights that you might fly on. <laughs> 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 um, so and I just want to wrap up now and say the thing to remember as Christians, this is, it's not a Lone Ranger experience. What we're doing tonight is critically important, that uh, we need to work together as a body to encourage each other. Uh, if your life is so busy that you don't have time to do this sort of thing or to get one-on-one -on -one with another believer, I'm talking to myself as well. That's why I used to be a helicopter right here up, up to a week ago. I sold it. I needed to simplify my life. I want to spend more time with people. I want to spend more time with my Christian brothers. Um, Lone Ranger, what he had, he always had Tano with him. So in a sense, this talks about in the scriptures, Paul is discipling, training, teaching Timothy. And what does he say? You, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What you've heard from me, in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Each one of us should be looking for someone maybe been a little bit further down the road than we have in the walk of faith. And we should look for someone behind us that we could bring them along and encourage them. This is one of the ways that we can really grow and I've been blessed by doing this myself. Someday, like I said, you need to keep in mind that we're going to see the King of the Universe face to face. New body, resurrection body. I'm going to lay aside these old taxi cabs and get a new one. Amen? Amen. <laughs> one that's fit for eternity, doesn't get old, get sick, die, put it six feet under. Those days will be gone. I'm talking about a body that goes on for eternity. New ears. I'm looking for new ears. I'm about to get hearing aids one of these days. <laughs> um, kingdom's coming. Brothers, I just thank you for your attention. Um, 
Uh, anytime you want to talk on any of these issues, you would really make my day. Come and see me. So uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Go ahead and cut this, Peter.